Historical Society would like to welcome you to the seventh year of our winter presentations. It's amazing that we've been doing this that long, but we keep finding wonderful local stories to tell. Uh, and this is a perfect ending to a perfect day. This weather was just unbelievable. And so we should all have a special day today. Um, before I introduce our speaker, I have several things to um, mention to you. We are passing out survey forms tonight. Uh, we're trying to get a sense of uh, how people hear about our programs, what they think of our programs, and if they have any ideas for future programs. So if you would fill out those survey forms and then turn them in after the program, there will be a couple people picking them up. We'd really appreciate it really help us to target our future programs. If you are members of the society, we thank you for your support. You know that, that the membership revenue is the bedrock of our society and provides our ability to do things <coughs> like these presentations. If you're not a member, we invite you to join. We have membership brochures in the back. And uh, if you'd like to leave your name and address with us on the survey form, We'll send you uh, one of our newsletters. We publish four newsletters a year, and we'd love to send one to you. Um, I'd like to mention that our annual meeting is March 3rd at 10 a.m. at the Ames Public Library, Farmville Brown Auditorium. And we're going to have two parts to our annual program. Uh, the first one is the debut showing of the videotape uh, on the ending of the Ames Tribune printing press. Uh, this, this video was done by b and Productions and Teresa Larson, and it's, it's a really interesting and uh, provocative documentary on a, kind of the ending of a chapter in our community. Also, uh, Dennis Wendell will give a preview of the Burton Mary Adams collection that will be on display across the street at our headquarters at 416 Douglas right after the meeting. Our speaker this evening is provided through a grant from Humanities Iowa, which has an extensive speaker bureau. This program has been funded by Humanities Iowa, a private nonprofit state affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities. Funding has also been provided in part by a grant from the Iowa Community Cultural Grant Program. Uh, Humanities Iowa has been a cultural resource for Iowans since 1971, offering funding for the Speakers Bureau event and for grants in support of public programs to Iowa nonprofit organizations. If you would like more information about Humanities Iowa, you may sign the sheet on the clipboard in the lobby. And finally, Dennis has asked me to sh show you all the brand new Pot Off the Presses 2011 Ames High Alumni Directory. Uh, the, the, one, the previous one has been several years old and, and many of us have been waiting for this. They are on sale in the lobby and some of the proceeds will go to the society. So if you've been waiting for one, they're here. The presentation tonight is by Hal Chase, currently the president of Farmers and Merchants Bancorp in Winterset, Iowa. Dr. Chase has three degrees in American history and has written extensively on African American history in Iowa. Joining Dr. Chase after the audiovisual uh, presentation will be local historians David Gradwell, Nancy Osborne Johnson, Bill Seilig, Shelley Orngard, and Dorothy Schweiger. And this is Peggy Bear, the president of the Ames Historical Society. <laughs> and then these people will be glad to sign for you if you don't have a copy already. They did make a deal. Five dollars of the twenty dollars, that's what they call will go to the Ames Historical Society tonight. So that may be said. But the short of it is this. Ten years ago this book came out, and it is 20 chapters. There are about 40 people who put this together, and some of those 
have agreed to join us tonight. So I'm going to start, if you will, David Gradwell, former professor, retired professor, I should say, uh, like myself. Please, David, stand up so that you can see. Next slide is Nancy Osborne Johnson. Thank you. The two of them wrote our chapter on Buxton. And so every chapter begins with a signature photograph. And some of you probably have heard or seen of the Buxton Wonders, a wonderful baseball team at the turn of the century. So they produced our first chapter, which in our minds was a comprehensive, as you say, microcosm of African American history in our state. Every facet of the other chapters, from education to military to law to doctors to business people to wage earners, politicians, uh, help me, music, women, artists, thank you. Buxton has had all of that, so that's why it was the first chapter. If you will keep standing, Dorothy Schweeter. <laughs> who was here a year ago, probably packed the place. They probably threw money. And uh, <laughs> they should. I think you know that Dorothy Schweeter is probably the most prominent historian of Iowa in our state's history. Uh, as the standard textbook, I of the Middle Lane. The relevance of that, it came out in 1996. It was the same year that we started Outside In. And one of the things she mentioned was the need for a comprehensive African American history of Iowa. So she did graciously accept our strong invitation to write our afterward. And that uh, was wonderful. She was also here last year presentation on Jack Trice and some of you probably heard. And next is Shelly Orngar. Here we go. <laughs> now folks, in 600 pages there are lots of mistakes, but there are a lot fewer because people like Shelly Orngar, she was our proofreader. And I think she and Bill worked together at the ISU Press before they outsourced it. So here we go with Bill Silent. Let's try it. good for the state, but it was mighty good for outside. <laughs> and Bill was the word editor, and he was the person who kept, I don't know how to say, all 20 chapters and forwards and prefaces and introductions and afterwards and so on, straight on his computer, which didn't crash, burn, or whatever. So there we go, folks. There are others. I wish we were all here. We've never been all in the same room. But that's the only reason I'm really here tonight, and that's why there is the Speakers Bureau presentation. So uh, it's based on Outside In. And tonight, in a few minutes, we're going to have about an 18 minute audio visual presentation. And it's like watching a movie. You're going to start in darkness, you're going to hear a recorded narrative. And then you are going to see slides that show you what you're hearing about. And there's a narrative. It's not long. And I promised Dr. Michael, Michael Martin and his wife Jackie they will be out of here before 8 o'clock and ISU versus Kansas State. <laughs> and so that's how we fair too. So, Michael, if you will stand up so people, because they're going to see you. And there you go. And then another Martin, different family, Mary Martin Carr, also came out tonight. And all of you are going to right there. Hopefully not professionally, because she, like Mrs. Chase, is a registered nurse and long. 42-year career, she said. So, appreciate you coming out. 
So I have a few more comments and then we go from there. This book as one fellow put it in his introduction, is a story for all islands. And one major concept I'm trying to get across tonight, which I heard Peggy mention, and that is our stories, as in local history, as in public history. Bill Slotley told a group of us, I'm going to say a dozen or more one day, right for the general public. And so Bill, I would, I would say, maybe you would, uh, is truly an advocate of public history. Public history says, if history is a study of past human actions, then it's a study of all of those actions. The challenge for public historians is to connect those stories. So as you see on this cover image, all those are little 99 counties. And then there are little photographs of African Americans and islands in our state's history. Because folks, everybody's story counts. It counts because it has impact on everybody else. It's easy to understand that. We all look in the mirror and we don't have to have gray hair to know that what we do has an impact on who we are and what we become. So in that sense, we're not only connected, I agree with a genealogical friend, we're related. And some of you also will remember, 11 years ago, January 2001, the Human Genome Project issued its report and it said, our DNA, yours, mine, everybody in this room, is 99.9% identical. So everybody in this room looks like they're old enough to remember. We got ivory soap beat by five points. <laughs> <laughs> so that is what this is really about. And so, I'm as strong on this as I can be. You folks are going to see things tonight, and you will remember, well, I've got a photograph. There you go. And we want it. And Al Sponheimer, if you will, stand up. And Wendell Spread, right next to him, please, Wendell. These two people have given me tremendous help. Way above that. Please keep standing. So there you go. Thank you. And, and they're building this wonderful archive. And everybody here has a family album where you have family photographs. And you may not, well, that's not history. It's not historical. Yes, it is. Most of the 887 photographs in this book came from personal family connect collections. And so they're trying to build local history. I am too. So if you have something that you know is relevant to African American history, come up and see me afterwards. I'll give you an address, I'll give you an email address, I'll give you a telephone number. Because it's out there. And what I hope you recognize tonight in these photographs, there's some photographs, they tell the story. Used to say. So that is what we're about tonight. Uh, 18 minutes of this. Uh, thanks very much and thanks for your help with the research. Reminds me, Becky Jordan would have been here tonight, but her husband, ISU archivist, gave a lot of help to this. Uh, unfortunately, her 
husband has some, what is it, love? A fibrillation. A That your heart beats still regularly, is that right, love? Because Mrs. Chase and Mary are both nurses. Uh, is there a doctor in the house that's really bad at the time? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry she couldn't be here tonight. It's not ours. It's what we've made. It's what we made and what we're making tonight. So, last thing. I call them the ancients. I have two carousel slide projectors. Now, you folks will know what those are. <laughs> I have a dissolver. I have a synchronizer. And I have a stacked stacker. Please join me in a silent prayer. Please work. <laughs> is, is Mike King here? <laughs> That's fine. Mike can attest that about 4 o'clock this afternoon, it worked. Bless them. Usually they like the big house. They love big screens. And so they should, they should come on full force tonight. So. Lastly and most of all, thank you folks for coming. Think about it. Wonder if you or I were the only ones here. But we're here together. We're here about African American history in Iowa. Thank you very, very much for coming out, and I hope you like what you see in here. In the beginning, our earth was without form, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And God said, let there be light. On the second day, God created the oceans, including the Atlantic, joining Africa and Europe with the Americas. On the sixth day, God created male and female with various complexions, as you see. In 1776, our founding fathers declared the independence of a new nation, dedicated to the proposition that all men and women are created with equal rights to life, liberty, and equality before the law. Yet some of them, like Thomas Jefferson, contradicted this ideal by participating in the transatlantic slave trade, in which some 10 million men, women, and children like these were crammed into ships like this one, taken to the Americas, and sold into slavery for life at public auctions. York was one of their descendants who helped Lewis and Clark explore the Louisiana Purchase in 1804. Hence, Iowa became a territory in 1838 and a free territory the following year. When Iowa Chief Justice Charles Mason outlawed slavery in our state, with his ruling in the case of Ralph. Iowa's free soil attracted free blacks from Illinois who bought these farms in Fayette County in 1852. Yet Dred Scott learned five years later that living on Iowa's free soil did not make him free. But Dred Scott's decision did not keep John and Governor from fleeing to Iowa for their freedom as this $200 reward for them in Burlington proves. Many other enslaved men and women, like those in this painting, escaped slavery on Iowa's Underground Railroad, shown on this map. James C. Jordan helped them do so from his home still standing in West Des Moines. And Isaac Brandt did the same from his home in East Des Moines. Both supported John Brown, the militant abolitionist who recruited Edwin Cobbick and four other Iowans for his famous raid on the federal arsenal in Harpers Ferry, Virginia in 1859. And the war came, as Lincoln said, in which white and black Iowans like these served under flags like this one of the 60th Iowa Regiment of U.S. Colored Troops to give a new birth of freedom to a government including these representatives and senator. Iowa became the bright radical star of this new freedom 
by being the first northern state to guarantee black men's right to vote in 1868, the same year that Alexander Clark Sr. sued and Iowa Chief Justice Chester Cole ruled that Muscatine must admit Clark's daughter Susan to its elementary school. Iowa's bright star faded a year later when a white mob murdered five blacks on the Dubuque. But it burned brighter when Alexander Clark Jr., standing beside the left pillar, became the first African American to graduate from the University of Iowa in 1879. But it burned low when Alan Adrian Cap Anson of Marshalltown, standing behind the black boy in the center, led the movement to exclude blacks from the major leagues in 1887. When Southern whites instituted legal segregation, disfranchisement, and convict lease in the South, African Americans began migrating north, like George Washington Carver, who moved to Winterset, Simpson College, and Iowa State in the 1890s to earn bachelor's and master's degrees. John L. Thompson did likewise to edit the Iowa Bystander in 1896, earn a law degree from Drake in 1898, and purchase the Bystander in 1911, which he used to feature black Iowans like Des Moines' James Burrell for serving in the Spanish-American War, Oskaloosa's George E. Taylor for being the first African-American nominated for president by a national party in 1904, and attorney George H. Woodson, seen standing top right, for being one of the original 29 members of the Niagara Movement founded in 1905 by Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois, who is in the Senate. But most migrated for better jobs, like these miners in Buxton, these steamboat roustabouts in Sioux City, and these track men in Marshalltown. The railroad also attracted Archie Martin, who worked for years for the Chicago Northwestern, and his wife Nancy to Ames in 1913, the year before World War I began in Europe. When President Woodrow Wilson asked Congress to declare war on Germany, to make the world safe for democracy in 1917, young black college men like these lobbied the War Department in Congress for admission to what became the Fort Des Moines Officers Training Camp, where these Iowa men were among the 629 who earned commissions in October 1917. Some of them trained black enlisted men like these at Camp Dodge, who became part of the segregated 92nd and 93rd divisions that fought in France. The war ended in November 1918, and Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois, editor of the NAACP's Crisis Magazine, urged black soldiers to return fighting for democracy in America. This militancy was met by murderous white mobs like this one in Chicago, and this one in Omaha during the red summer of 1919, the same year that James H. Banning moved to Ames with his family from Oklahoma to begin his career as a renowned barnstormer in Miss Ames. 1919 was also the year that Archie and Nancy Martin bought this lot and built this home, <laughs> still standing, at 218 Lincoln Way, where they provided room and board for black ISU male students from the 1920s to the 1940s. Frederick D. Patterson did not board at the Martins, but after earning his DMV in 1923, he became president of Tuskegee and later founded the United Negro College Fund. That same year, Jack Trice died playing for ISU. A year later, the Klan held a conclave in Ames, like this one in Des Moines, two years later, and paraded down Main Street as they would through downtown Des Moines. Such white racism was overcome by the victories of Saul Butler, Dubuque's 1920 Olympia, Frederick Duke Slater, All-American play for Iowa, 
and the founding of the National Bar Association in Des Moines in 1925 by Mrs. Gertrude Rush, Charles B. Howard Sr., S. Joe Brown, James B. Moore Sr., and George H. Woodson. In the 1930s, ISU chemistry professor Henry Gilman began a pipeline of black graduate students that also overcame it. Nathaniel o. o. Calloway was the first to earn his doctorate in 1933. Dr. Hubert B. Crouch was the second in 1936, whose long teaching career was capped by the founding of the National Institute of Science because it was excluded from the American Institute of Science. Samuel P. Massey was another who worked with Gilman on chemical warfare during <coughs> World War II, worked his way up the academic ladder to the presidency of North Carolina Central University, and being the first African American in the National Science Foundation and on the faculty of the United States Naval Academy. The faith of congregations like that of Corinthian Baptist in Des Moines also overcame white racism. So did the armed self-defense of the Knoxville Men's Gun Club. The solidarity of these United Mine Workers gathered in Des Moines. The brotherhood of these Elks seen outside their lodge in Waterloo. And the sisterhood of these Eastern Star members in Marshalltown. But black Iowans overcame white racism most of all with a love of families like that of Cornette Allen's in Ottumwa. Family, faith, solidarity, and self-defense also helped black Iowans through the Great Depression in the 1930s. So did switching their political allegiance from the Republican to Democratic Party because of New Deal programs like the National Youth Administration which hired these young Sioux City women. Hawkeye track star Edward Gordon's 1932 Olympic gold medals and the Des Moines performances of Paul Robeson at Hoyt Sherman and Josephine Baker at the Billigan. African Americans fought white racism at home as well as Nazi white racism abroad during World War II. Striking blows in this double V campaign overseas were Luther Smith of Des Moines, one of the famous Tuskegee Airmen, Clarinda's Vernon Baker, who earned a long overdue Medal of Honor in 1997, Leo Sims of Ames, who served in the military police, and the 7,000 black women who trained at the Fort Des Moines WAC camp. Striking blows against white racism in Iowa after World War II were Meredith Saunders of Mason City, who won his Eagle Scout badge in 1945. These University of Iowa co-eds who integrated Courier Hall in the fall of 1946, and Edna Griffin, who led the others that you see here picketing Katz Drug Store in Des Moines for refusing them ice cream cones in 1947. A year before Iowa native, vice president and pioneer hybrid founder Henry A. Wallace campaigned for president on the Progressive Party with the slogan, Jim Crow must go. Ames High students got the message and a year later elected Fred Martin as their student body, student body president. Before the 1954 Brown decision, Johnny Bright attacked white racism with his all-American play for Drake. Herman Walker overcame it with every drink he poured and every table he waited on at the Ames Elks Club. Yep. Waterloo's William Parker undermined it with every decision he made as Iowa's first black judge. And blues legend Big Bill Brunsey, who lived a year in Ames, Des Moines' soulful Irene Miles, and jazz pianist Ernest Speckred subverted with every song they sang or played. In the 60s, these roving ambassadors from Des Moines challenged white racism all over the country with their Know Your Neighbor campaign. Tom Offenberger's Shenandoah on the left did likewise as Dr. King's press secretary. 
Kalanji Sadiq and other Des Moines Black Panthers attacked it militantly, while Willie Stevenson Clanton, Iowa's first black female legislator, and the Reverend James Thomas, Iowa's first black Methodist bishop, opposed it more moderately. Far away in Vietnam, Vincent Lewis of Des Moines fought his own war against it, and barriers fell. In the 70s, Miss Cheryl Brown, Brown of Luther College became the first black contestant in the Miss America pageant. James Harris, Des Moines Middle School art teacher, won the presidency of the NEA. Dr. William Hunter won the directorship of Iowa State's Research Institute for Studies in Education. And Charles L. Samuels won the job of ISU's first affirmative action officer. In the 80s, Dr. Percy Harris of Cedar Rapids became the first African American on our Board of Regents. Jesse Jackson won 11% of our caucus votes in 1988. And Dr. Fred Graham retired from Iowa State after 37 years of teaching aero engineering. In the 90s, Bobby Douglas began coaching ISU's wrestling team, and Thomas Hill began managing its student affairs. Iowa State PhD Michael Martin directed international research for Garcia, and Mary Martin Carr kept a 42 career by managing the Physical Rehabilitation Center at Greeley Hospital. But it was Dr. Paul Mahone and Karen Drake who put Iowa's African American history on the nation's front pages with their delivery of the McCoy septuplets. In the last decade, ISU renamed its football stadium for Jack Trice. Dr. Derek Rollins led the challenge to rename it a hall for Carrie Chapman Cap because of her racist statements. While Wayne Clinton listened to Dennis Wendell's concerns for the Ames Historical Society. The Ames High Boys basketball team won the 4A state championship two years ago. And just a week ago, ISU wrestling coach Kevin Jackson unequivocally denounced hazing. But it was Barack Obama's victory in Iowa caucuses four years ago which catapulted him into the victory in the primaries and the presidential election that changed our nation's history. <clears throat> Yet white racism remains as you see, and most still see themselves as either black or as white. We'd rather not think about this, but instead applaud the thunderous baritone of Centerville native Simon Estes. Moving beyond racism means seeing each other as beautiful, like these bridesmaids and flower girls, as classmates like these in Waterloo, and teammates like these who took Drake to the Final Four, as comrade in arms like these two from Mason City, and human beings capable of eliminating racism as well as polio. It means reaching out and taking hold of the lifeline that Copley painted in his famous allegory, Watson and the Shark, and going forward arm in arm to create the new people, like the Nowers of Des Moines and the Washingtons of Knoxville, from the best of Africa, the best of Asia, the best of Europe, and the best of the Americas. So fill in the blank for race with America, citizen of a nation dedicated to the belief that no one is born a bigot, that God made all of us of one blood, and that the other, the outsider, is who we are on the inside. If we do, we'll be forever free from the exploitation of the transatlantic slave trade, the cruel brutality 
of American slavery. The lie of white supremacy. And its vicious defense by lynching and by assassination. Such freedom will not come by the sword, but by living the truth in this young woman's eyes that the lives of ordinary men and women like us have shaped who we are as a people and as a nation. I tried to make it as clear as I could. You saw the flyer first. So it's September 1926 in Des Moines. They're going to have a Klon cave. Al uh, emailed me a scanned article from the Ames Tribune. They had the same things earlier in September 1924. That's the reference in there. You may gone too quickly. And then the photograph was of the Klan marching through downtown Des Moines, just as, by analogy, they marched through downtown, from Maxwell Park through downtown in September 1924 in And I'm glad you said that. Al said it here. That's my question, I guess, is... Do you uh, have the photograph of it? No, my question, I guess, is, uh, is that about when they peaked, and, uh, or did they peak at a later date in, in the Iowa area, Central Iowa area? And uh, oh, we were happy to have the late date. Did you find anything that caused their uh, you know, disappearance uh, and uh, um, legalization? <coughs> Was 1926, 27 the peak? You said it rose, you thought, till about 1920. Started 22, 23, I heard, remember saying, and you said it sort of started to fade, 26, 27. Um, and he has about 250 letters on the Klan 
Letters that were written by his uncle when his uncle belonged to the Klan in Marathon, Iowa. And he wondered if anyone in the department would be interested in working with these. Well, absolutely. <laughs> and uh, the letters arrived, and very interesting. This was a young man, about 22 years old, uh, not yet married. In fact, these were letters that he had written to his girlfriend in Boone, Iowa. And he, he would later <coughs> marry her. And this girlfriend was a keeper, fortunately. She kept all of these letters. And it formed the basis of an article that I wrote uh, about the Klan. But um, <coughs> it, it just, um, it seemed that people in Marathon, Iowa, joined the Klan for a whole variety of reasons. I think for this young man, 22 years old, living on a farm, I think he found it a form of entertainment. Uh, I don't think in the entire letters, of the 250 letters, he really expressed any serious racial discrimination. But his friends belonged to the Klan. He joined the Klan. And uh, just a whole variety of reasons. Well, all I can add to that, and I'm sure the rest of us can too up here, the Klan in this country, you need to know, was like 100% American. And they used that phrase, and it was very, very Christian in its rhetoric. Uh, not unlike Adolf Hitler and the National Socialist Party in Germany at the time, and thus the swastika, that medieval cross, German cross. And then, of course, there's a correlation there. Uh, Willis Gowdy, who could not be here tonight, he's down in Arizona. Wonderful man who taught for years demography, did our chapter on demography, uh, made the statement that over 70% of Iowans had some German heritage. Uh, maybe there's some kind of correlation there. Next question or comment. And in light of that, I found it very interesting that uh, some of the research I did indicated that as a percentage of those uh, of the population, Iowa had more casualties in the Civil War in any other state. And certainly a lot of Iowans volunteered and served in the Civil War. You had all the stuff about the Underground Railroad. And it always puzzled me because here we are out in the western wilderness, you know, there aren't a lot of blacks here. And yet Iowans seem to be very interested in fighting the Civil War for apparently reasons of combating slavery, who knows? And it's kind of an interesting counterpart to all the people who joined the, the Klan. I'm just curious, why do you think Iowans were so maybe ahead of the rest of the country in terms of civil rights for blacks serving in the Civil War? I never understood why that, why that was. The question, let me see if I paraphrase this correctly. He was interested, he started off by saying that there is a, a point of view that Iowa had the highest per capita percentage of casualties in the Civil War of any state in the Union. And that they were, as in some aspects, take four years ago and the caucuses, um, you'd say very, uh, liberated from racist views, and then here's all this conversation, dialogue about a very strong clan. But in your article, you said it was at least as much anti-Catholic as it was anti-black, anti-Jewish, what have you. Um, so that's that. So there you go. You're the story of Iowa. Here you go. <laughs> um, uh, as far as the Klan, it, in, um, it was really, of course, in the South, um, anti-African American, but in, in the state of Iowa, it was really directed, as you, as you mentioned, uh, Hal, against uh, Catholics and against foreigners. I mean, those were its two, those were its uh, two main goal of what both. We have another American historian here. Urban historian. Sure. Yeah. 
Just to complicate, just to complicate things a little bit, uh, that's your question about why so many islands served with the dedication that they did. And there's some controversy um, among the scholars in this field. And as I said, I just finished a book on this. Bob Dykstra, uh, Hal had Bob Dykstra's book cover on the screen, Bright Radical Star. It seems, and this is just my take on it, I'm not an expert, um, it seems that Iowa's legislators, well, legislators were probably in advance of, of their counterparts in other states. And there are a number of reasons for that period of settlement, popularity of Lincoln, westward expansion, a lot of those kind of uh, uh, positive ideas. Um, as for the casualty rates, I found an interesting thing. This is a massive study of quantitative information about 45,000 Union troops trying to determine why were troops so courageous? Why the Civil War was a horror show. I mean, I mean, I've, I've been in history a long time, and I was shocked to be reminded that um, so many people died, more casualties in the Civil War than in almost in all the other wars, all the other military involvements the United States has been in combined. It is said in this book that one of the reasons for the courage of Civil War soldiers, particularly in Iowa, Civil War military companies were raised on a local level. You were in Ames, you signed up with other Ames people. You went to war in Arkansas or wherever with other Ames people. You didn't turn and run. You stood your ground and you fought till you fell. What would the neighbors say? True. There was a great community spirit among Iowa troops. And that was given in this book I just read, which is pretty, uh, pretty well, um, uh, the, the scholars have good credentials for writing this stuff. They say Iowa troops were determined to hang on to the end for the sake of their community and their reputations in it. What would it mean for the family back home in a town the size of Ames with 5,000 people? If word got back, and they wrote letters like crazy, <laughs> If word got back that Jimmy had skipped when the shooting started, okay? Iowa had more localism to its Civil War recruits than most other states. And it had a very low desertion rate, a very high casualty rate, because people did not run among the Iowa troops to the degree that they did in other troops. I'm from New York, so this is not any kind of chauvinism. New Yorkers were terrible at Union soldiers. They were from the big city. They didn't even show up in the muster. Who knew? There were so many of them. You didn't get away with that even in the war in those days. So that's just a new one. The real question is how come so many of them were there in the first place? I understand once they're there, unit cohesion takes over. Right. But why did they go in the first place? A 20 year old kid in Ames or Marshalltown who wouldn't go? Why aren't you going? Everybody went. Well, why? Why not the people from Kansas? Again, from the reason it's given in the book I'm talking about was because Iowa had such localistic, lo location-based troops. You went with your neighbors, your schoolmates. Um, I haven't read another study of a specific state, but I know the study I'm talking about describes the behavior of troops from uh, Union uh, Army companies from all the states. Iowa stands out. Wisconsin stands out. Minnesota stands out. These are places which are recently settled and tend to be small farming communities. People knew each other. I'd like to add one other point on perspective on this dialogue. Folks, in 1857, the Iowa legislature passed a law that basically said, no, we are not going to extend the vote to men. Women weren't even thought of. 1857. Then, after the war, particularly Grenville Dodge, who was a major figure in logistics, 
and others like him, Edward Hatch, come back to this state and they see what African American men had done. And they campaigned hard for that change in 1868. As far as going to war, motivating, a lot of Iowans, including uh, James C. Jordan, who had been a slave trader in Kentucky, they hated slavery. Probably not so much love lost on African Americans, but in the culture they grew up in, it was dominated by slaveholders. They didn't have an opportunity for land. They came here. And so that came together and with this bonding experience in war is what basically Dykstra says in Bright Radical Star in an answer to your question. He, he really does. He takes that on right away. The next one. Coming right to you, sir. Please give us your name. Thank you, Dr. Chase. My name is Bill Marion. Uh, Beverly, uh, my wife, and I were privileged to be students at Berea College in Kentucky. Uh, from a little bit off on dates here, but from uh, 49 to 53. And I'll jump back another 50 years because in when that school was opened, and the first president being John G. Fee, himself a strong abolitionist, became president, he said, we should open this school to <clears throat> all races, all colors, and we will have no discrimination on this campus, a little wee bit of a campus, Berea College, Kentucky. That law, known as Kentucky Day Law, persisted on the law in Kentucky until uh, maybe off a year or two, I'm going to say 1950, uh, 1951. Then it was reopened to notably blacks. Other minorities certainly might apply, as they did. And so I think this is somewhat parallel to the wonderful story you're telling here about this issue in Iowa. It's wonderful to have Berea in the house. Bar Bariah Green was another man who was great. Don't get me off on Cassius Marcellus Clay, for whom the boxer was named, but it was another man. Ooh, it is, and the basketball game is starting. So, Peggy's just reminding me. Does somebody else have a question or comment? Yes, ma'am. What happened in Boxholm? Where did you go? Where did people go? Well, <laughs> oh, Buxton. I'm sorry, I used to Boxholm, and I'm taking just up the road here. And as far as I know, they're still there. And uh, so Buxton. Buxton was a company town. And this man, and Nancy, and Dorothy Schweeter all wrote books, so I'm out on this one. Well, essentially, the Consolidation Coal Company closed down its operation in Buxton and uh, moved to Console and Bucknell and other places. So when the company closed down, there wasn't uh, much <laughs> left for people to do there. Some of the people moved on and worked in the coal mines, and uh, some of them uh, went to other cities in Iowa and to um, and across the country. It's amazing uh, when you travel around the country how many people you run into that, that have uh, ancestors that came from Buxton. And uh, so today it's basically uh, uh, cropland, cornfields, soybean fields, and so forth. Um, I think you can't even call it a ghost town because there isn't much standing there. And buildings that we saw, Nancy and I, standing there in, in the early 1980s, some of those are disintegrating also. 
But while I have the microphone, and uh, my colleagues may want to say something too, but I think that uh, if you're talking about race relations and people uh, getting along, this is the thing I think that has impressed me most about Buxton, um, which certainly uh, one can see uh, some vestige of this in the archaeological residue, but most of it isn't there. It's in the minds of people who live there and whose uh, things they passed on to their uh, descendants is that people got along there. There, there was uh, some intermarriage there between blacks and whites, which certainly wasn't occurring much around the rest of the state. Uh, there weren't uh, clan activities there, though uh, maybe the cells uh, uh, weren't established till Buxton was pretty well along uh, the way. But I think that Buxton was a model for its time, but I think it's also a model for us today, that people got along. Uh, blacks and whites weren't estranged from each other because they were neighbors, pretty much. And uh, there also was a good economic base there, and I think that helped the fact that there wasn't economic competition. But maybe Dorothy Schweeter wants to add something to that, I don't know whether, about the leaving Buxton, and, and Buxton is a model of, uh, well, a utopia, you call it, in your book. Um, one of the things that we just couldn't find out when we were researching um, the archives for, for Buxton and talking to people who had lived in Buxton. Um, what was the motivation of the two men most responsible for creating that community? It was a coal mining subsidiary of the Consolidation Coal Company. That meant that all of the coal produced in Buxton went to the Chicago Northwestern Railroad. That was a common practice in the 1920s. The railroads had their captive mines where the coal supplied the, uh, the power for the trains. And the question, um, John Buxton and Ben Buxton, a father and son, who were the two superintendents of the, Bu of Buxton, of the Buxton coal mining operation, what did they intend to do when they created Buxton? Because they really did. They were responsible for overseeing where the site was established, where the people were drawn from who came to work in Buxton. And it was extremely frustrating. We could never find any evidence of what their motivation was. Did they intend to create a model community? Did they intend to create this integrated community that Buxton eventually did become? And uh, it, it's just one of those things in history you sometimes can't find the answer. And, and we never could. But I certainly agree with David. Uh, it was a model community. Race relations seemed to be very good. Uh, it was an exceptional company in terms of what they offered their workers. And let me put in, well, maybe not a plug, but another thing that the Iowans don't generally recognize, it was 100% unionized. Uh, Iowans don't think of this state as perhaps being uh, an important union state, but in coal mining, United, uh, United Mine Workers, uh, they were organized in every coal camp in the state. That didn't mean that every miner belonged to the union, but they were organized in every coal camp. And Buxton was a major, uh, major union community. Yeah, I'd like to take a little different tack because, I mean, this program tonight wouldn't have even been possible without those historic photographs, right? And Hal was talking about how important the photographs are. And this is what we found when we were working in Buxton. I mean, we're archaeologists, and we being the dirt. But we were, had this privilege of talking to people who actually had lived in this town. And uh, so when we, in the course of talking with them, of course, asked them, do you have photographs? And they would. And we'd say, may we copy them? And so we did. And we started to catalog them and, and record who all was in these photographs. And then we start talking to some other folks. And we found out, oh my goodness, this thing said, I've never seen a photograph of my father, who was an African-American coal miner. And by golly, somebody else had a photograph of him. She had never seen it. What a precious thing for her. At any rate, so there's a lot to be 
come from this kind of thing. I mean, we, we might talk about the history and all this sort of thing, but it comes down to photographs. So if you have photographs, they are one of the most precious things you own. I just want to add something that's slightly off the tap and puts it in a broader perspective in terms of Iowa law and civil rights. Um, I mean, Iowans, like the rest of Americans, are pretty s severely divided politically. Uh, and a lot of people see Iowa as a conservative state, other people see it as a liberal state. And I guess you could look at our two senators and say everybody's right. <laughs> but but the, the thing that impresses me about uh, a lot of the legislation um, in Iowa is that it's been, uh, it was certainly liberal in terms of civil rights of human beings early on in regard to black people. And uh, there were some landmark decisions and legislation in terms of women's rights. And the Meskwaki Indians, in terms of buying their land, which was an unusual thing for them, for Native Americans to do because they didn't perceive the human relationship to land as having a piece of paper that says you own it. But it is a credit to the Iowa legislature that they allowed the Meskwaki to have that land because uh, it didn't go that way in a lot of other states. And I would say that the recent Supreme Court decision in terms of uh, same-sex marriage is also uh, liberal in terms of civil rights and right, correct, but I wouldn't expect everybody in this room to agree with me. But I think you can see a basis, not only for African Americans, but a lot of other constituent groups um, that where I was taking the lead on civil rights. Let me just add on top of that wonderful phrase that I just learned this past weekend. Jesus never called us to agree with one another. He did call us to love one another. So Kathy, Hal's answer, one word answer to that riddle is love. And some people are loving other people and they have to be of different genders and so they have children. And there are lots of those folks walking around. And we'll get there. It'll take time, in my opinion. Obviously, more time. But folks, uh, the fact that you've all come out here tonight is, is encouragement to me. And thank you very, very much for coming. Please do. W wonderful uh, comment by Nancy. Think about it. Go home and look at those photographs. Or the next time you have them out, keep an eye open uh, for that wonderful connection between so-called black and so-called white in our state, in our nation, in this world. So, thanks again, Dames Historical Society. Thank all of you for coming, making this a wonderful evening. God bless and go Cyclones. <laughs>